time I've been to your church to teach this, and it's my pleasure. I look forward to doing this because if it helps one person to save another, it's well worth it. I think Maureen can speak and Tracy can speak to past uh, Father Clarence, who took this class along with everyone. And the very next Sunday, someone ran down the aisle after him with a cane, and he knew exactly what to do. And so did the usher. So it, it helped already. So we want to give you some tips on how to follow your plan. So I would say that what you need to know is the next slide after me would be um, safety is our priority. Everywhere you go, safety is your priority. So in case of an emergency, we want you to exit out the nearest door and go out to the parking lot. Does that make sense to everybody? We don't want you to run over people, but we want you to go to the parking lot. And during church, during mass, or during anything that's going on in this facility, um, they will have a check-in and check-out sheet. So while we're in here today, I'd really like to silence your cell phones. If you need to take a call, please go out. And then um, be courteous to others. Even if you've taken this class or heard about this class, be courteous to others. And then we'll have question and answer period after each of the sessions, because there'll be two. And then um, this it coincides, this training coincides with FEMA planning. So the intention of the plan is to prepare the parish members for unexpected emergencies. So we want you to be calm and to make good decisions when there's something going on. When I was in the earthquake, I was in high school, there was an earthquake, and everybody got out of their chairs and they ran down the stairs and they trampled each other. That wasn't very calm, was it? It's not very common sense decision to get up and run, but that's what people do, they run. So we want you to make sure that you think about this and know what you're going to do. So you have, and the school has a earthquake emergency plan, and the procedures in the school are not included here because you already have them. So anybody here have school kids beside you? Okay, so you do have a plan for the school. So you can ask the administration office if you need to. So let's talk about the evacuation protocol. While you're, uh, during, during an <coughs> evacuation, we want you to know that the priests and the ushers and the leaders, we have designated <coughs> leaders, they will give you directions. And those directions should promote the safety uh, of the parishioners, the children, and the staff, not just people in front of them, but we're talking about everyone. And the, someone will be calling 911. Does everybody here know the address here? What's your address for your church? 30525 8th Avenue South. Good, there's one. People don't know, do they? If you call 911, you need to know what's your address. Okay? I, I try to tell everybody that at my church too, and they don't know. <laughs> also, they will have walkie talkies that can retrieve from the usher's closet. Some of you don't know where these things are, but you can find out. Um, the nursery, the facilities, <coughs> and the parish administrative offices. Do you, do, does everybody know where they are? Mm -hmm. Okay. And then everybody, every room has an evacuation exit <coughs> route to the designated gathering point. And where is the gathering point? Parking lot. Parking lot. Good. So you kind of look at the review maps as you go down the halls to see maybe where would you go. And then we also know that they give us uh, indications on where the fire extinguishers are, where the pole stations, you would pull that fire pole, and then where the medical kits. If somebody said to you, go get a medical kit, would you know where it was? But you can, you can find out by looking at those placards. Also, the gathering points are going to be away from where the first responders might come into the parking lot. So we want to make sure that they're safe coming in and you're safe where you're gathering. So we don't want you near the responder vehicles. So after an evacuation, there's going to be what we call protective, personal protective <coughs> equipment. We call that a PPE. So if a nurse has a mask or a nurse has a gown, that's her PPE needs. So you would have that too. And there would be things like masks, gloves, 
things like that where they could get to them from the closet, as your closet. They also have here a NOAA weather radio. They tell us perhaps maybe in the winter time what kind of storms are coming or what the weather's going to be like in the next hour or so. That's also in the facilities office and the usher's closet. And NOAA stands for National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Has anybody ever seen a NOAA radio? It's pretty cool. All right. So, and if, if you can't get into the closet or the area where you need to, then ask. Ask for the key. Um, one of the things that we want to do is to try to stay in place so you, people are not running all over the place. And um, that, that could be for any emergency that you have, whether it's somebody fainting, somebody having a heart attack, somebody got cut. You know, try not to run around so that people know where you're going. Battery 100%. Connected to SBBP, LA, YLUTH, NAS, I got to SBBP, LA, PCOP. So the other thing is going to happen, there's a, there'll be some people who will, it, after, the, after this hap happens, they will go outside and inspect the structure to see if there's any damage. And they'll have paperwork with them and they'll document what's going on. And they will also wear the PP&Es and they will have a buddy with them. We always encourage people to have a buddy so that you never go anywhere alone. And that's where my friend Donna, didn't come tonight. She's my buddy. In any emergency, she's my buddy. So these are all things that you might not think about, but we want to kind of bring to you to your thought. So um, let's see. Uh, there will be some notification signs up because the team of people will make a determination, and we will not allow people to come back into the building because we don't know if it's safe on the inside. So we would want you to stay outside. So there will be a no entry of the facility <coughs> until the authorities deem that it's, it's OK. So let's talk about the children. So children might be in different places. They might be the liturgy of the word. It might be sacrament preparation or the nursery or in other rooms during mass. So if, that's, if there's an emergency that occurs, they're going to remain under the supervision of their, their teachers and their designated leaders. Um, and they may be in other campus buildings. So we're, we're telling you now, your children will not be released <coughs> directly from the building. And that's for their safety. So we want, we want accountability on where the kids are, right? So. Some of the leaders are going to be the ushers, the priests, the first responders, and the designated leaders. <coughs> and we will have people assigned to go take the children to the sports field in the upper parking lot. <coughs> and by the end of tonight, you're going to be able to say that so well. Where are we taking the kids? Sports field, field, field and upper park 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 park. Does everybody know where that is? Yeah. Perfect. That's what you're going to do. You're going to come back into the office. You're not going into the rooms. You're not picking up your baby. You're not going into the mass again. You're going to the parking lot. So that is because we have wanted to avoid injury. And also, here comes the, the emergency vehicles, right? We don't want to get in their way. So we're going to go up to the parking lot, to the sports field. So the other thing is that people are going to get excited. They're going to say, I see my child over there. I want to go get him. Nope. You're not going to get them. You will go to the sports field, and then they'll check them out to you. So they have, they have their protocol, and we want to follow it because it's safety, the safety of the children, safety of you. So where are we going to pick the kids up? Sports field. Does everybody know where that's at? Yes. yes. Okay, great. <coughs> so before they start mass, the children are, are um, checked in and out of the nursery. And they have a sign-up book, and it's and it's kept near the door. So that's because we want to keep an accurate record of who's in the room, who's being tended to, and what's your child's name. So there's two doors from the exit. Uh, there's an interior door that heads toward the narthex. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? And then there's an exterior door. So what we want you to do is when you're when you're in that area, take take a look at the 
the uh, evacuation map posted so that you're pretty familiar with where they're going to be going. So if there's, during an evacuation directive, uh, the nursery leaders are going to stay calm because we don't want to frighten the kids, right? And they will get the kids organized as quickly as possible and transport them to the sports field. So where are we going to take them? Sports field. By the airport. Airport. Okay. So the infants are going to be taken like in a little wagon or a cart, and the walking children can have this grab and grow rope. Have you ever seen those? They just hang on to it, and it's fun for them. And then the, the leader will take the roster to the evacuation gathering point. And that's because we want to make sure that we're checking the rooms, making sure there's no one there. We have the roster. We know how many children we're supposed to have and who's taking care of what age children. So it's all good. It's all for the safety and evacuation of the kids. So afterwards, again, we're going to take that roster to the evacuation point, check the kids out, and make sure that the door is open once they've evacuated. Is that correct? Okay. Now, if there's a fire, then what will we do? Close the door. Close the door because we don't want to add any fuel to that fire. Okay? So the people whose children are up in the sports field are only going to be able to pick them up in the where? Sports, sports field. field. The party. The party. And there will be a sign-in book, and then you can sign your children out and you can go. Okay, so don't get angry at people because they're following the protocol, because that's why we created this. Just be calm. You know, if the adults are upset, the children are upset. If the adults are fine and calm and following protocol, the kids will follow along too, and it'll be fun for them. We don't want them to be afraid. So the next thing we want to talk about is fire emergencies. Now, next week, you will have uh, hands-on with the fire emergency people, the fire firefighters. But we still want to talk about some certain things um, when we do have an emergency. So we have ordinances in the city of Federal Way. And it is no parking in the fire lanes. That's a tough one because people always want to park there, especially during an emergency. Because they're just driving around and want to pick their kids up. So um, the first thing we're going to do, of course, if there is a fire or emergency, we're going to notify the pastor, report the fire, the smoke, or the bur burning odor. And then we're going to call 911 or pull the fire alarm and get the building to become evacuated. So we want to follow directions. It may be the priest, it may be an usher, and it may be a first responder. Again, we've got uh, evacuation notices uh, posted near the sanctuary exit so you know which way to go. And then we're going to go to the nearest exit to go to the sports uh, upper parking. So who's going to give us instructions, do you suppose? Pastor, the usher. Pastor, the ushers, or the first responders. Or the first responders. So, have any of you uh, worked a fire extinguisher? One, two, three. Okay. You pull the pin, really shot the fire. Yeah. Awesome. Is this scary? It is scary. I did it myself at the fire station down here, and I was scared. <laughs> so, Trained personnel should be the ones who operate the extinguishers. And if you want to learn how to do that, you can take a CERT class and they'll teach you. We are only going to work on a small fire, not a large fire. Okay, small fire. So we have this procedure that we follow. It's called PASS, P-A-S-S. -S, and it means pull and twist the pin. And you're going to pull it all the way out. You're going to aim the nozzle at the bottom of the fire and you're going to squeeze the trigger and then sweep at the base of the fire from side to side. If you cannot get it out, then you need to back yourself away and get out of there. If it's big enough, then we overhaul. We simply look to make sure that it's distinguished, and that's what we call overhaul. You check and make sure, and then you leave the area. So what size of the fire? Small, small fire. Like maybe, 
maybe a basket fire like that, you can put that out. If it goes to uh, beyond that, then we want you to stop. We don't want you to go any further, and we want you to close the door, isolate the fire, <coughs> close the windows, close the door, and leave the area. If you should catch your clothing on fire, then we want you to drop, cover, and roll. And that is very, very true because my mom got burned from the fireplace, Ember, clothes on fire, and she rolled, and she was fine. So she knew what to do. So the biggest thing is I want to tell you guys is don't block those fire lanes. They're pretty well marked out there in your area. And, and what is our priority? Safety. Safety. Sure. Yes. Earlier, didn't you say that the, one of the gathering points was the parking lot? The, it will be an area around the parking lot. It won't be in the parking lot. It could be on the grassy area, or it could be in a lower area a parking lot where the fire engines are not coming in. For the so first this is something point. separate from the upper, from the sports field. Yeah, there could be. There could be some areas. And it depends on the safety of the vehicles coming in and how many first responders we are going to have. But I think that the leaders will know exactly what to do and who to have follow them. But that's a good question. Sports field is for the kids. That's where they're designating the kids. So if there is a fire emergency, we want you to make sure that you assist others with medical care. And one of the things is some people don't know how. So we're going to kind of hopefully give you some clues tonight on how. Um, you want to assist and listen carefully to people. You want to listen and deal with urgent situations right away. And please don't re-enter the building unless the first responders or the priests or the designated leaders tell you it's okay. <coughs> they will have a sign up on the door, not enter, but once the sign is down, I think you could. Any questions about fire or evacuation? No? Okay. We're going to go to earthquakes. How many have been in an earthquake? Yes! Kind of scary, huh? So it's really kind of a dangerous event, um, mostly because uh, there's a lot of times there's no warning. There may be a little that people ignore it. And there's many, many dangerous aftershocks at times. Um, sometimes people can be injured if they move uh, move more than five feet during the shaking. So we ask you to drop, cover, and hold. So, and it, a, lot of fatil uh, a lot of fatalities occur because people run outside. And so what happens then? What happens if you run outside? Things can fall, people could trample you, because people get scared. So we're talking to you about church. When you're in church, we, we're, we're saying, let's crouch down in your seat as low as you can, possibly in your pew, and use one arm to protect the back of your head or your neck or your face, and then uh, use your other hand maybe to hold on to the pew or the, the seat cushion. Just stay crouched until it stops shaking. Okay? A lot of people can't get down. A lot of people like me got a bad knee, can't get down, but do the best that you can to stay safe. So we could, one of the things that we could also do is sit on the floor of an exterior wall of, of protected from falling objects. And that would be, what would be something that would be falling that could hurt you? Light fixtures. Sure. Okay, light fixtures. Statues. Statues, and absolutely, and absolutely, and absolutely. yeah. And you just don't know. Out in the foyer, do you have a bookshelf? Okay, that could tip too. So just um, remain in place because we don't want to have any injury from aftershocks. And so what do we tell you in the very beginning? Stay calm, don't run, and wait for assistance to come, whether it's a leader, whether it's a firefighter, or Maybe it's the priest that tells you, go from this room to that room. You'll follow his, his or her directions. And we really pref prefer that you don't go outside because there may be falling 
falling branches from trees and maybe falling wires from from you know wires that go across the streets. So we really ask that you don't go running outside. And then don't evacuate unless you're told to do so by priest or the first responders. And after the shaking stops, then check yourself. Make sure that you don't have any injuries. Some people have gotten you know, whacked on the side of the head and don't realize that they're bleeding, but just check yourself or some, ask your friend next to you to check you. Um, we can request that medical professionals, the church members, the CERT members, we have CERT members in this church that have been trained, and they can triage. Does anybody know what triage means? They can wrap up your arm, they can put a splint on your leg, they can make you comfortable, and they can give you first aid. So we want you to remain until you're instructed that you can leave. So then once we get to leave, we want to go to the next, the closest exit and go up to the upper sports field if you've got children up there or the upper parking lot. <coughs> and as you did mention before, if somebody designated another area in a parking lot, maybe around the back, that's great. Just follow directions the best that you can. Our big priority is your safety. So. The children are going to undergo uh, other procedures that they've been taught in their classrooms with their teachers and their leaders. So they'll know what to do exactly. They don't. They know that they're not going to go back into the building. They're going to follow the instructions of those that are teaching them. And they'll be released to their parents. Where? <laughs> okay. All right. I think you guys got it. So this is a picture of Puget Sound and the risks that we have here in Puget Sound. And we have, believe it or not, three fault zones. So we have one that goes down 320th. I don't know if you can see it here. There's one in Federal Way here. So we've got one up in Tacoma, and there's one in Olympia. So. Um, that means that it would be a little bit more unsteady. The, the roads could break down. We could, we could not get places that we needed to get because the roads are buckled. Those are, those are fault lines that are going right through the cities. So one of the fault lines goes right down 320th. So you may be cut off north and south. Does, who lives in Tacoma, anybody? Okay, so the Tacoma, there's one up in Bremerton, and there's one down in Tacoma that hooks onto I-5 right here. See that? And I think you have a picture in your paperwork. Uh, there is going to be earthquakes, there's going to be hazmat situations that are going to be having to dealt with by the fire department. Sometimes we have these things happen when it's winter storms severe weather, and, and what happens when the power goes out. So we will have those things. What do you think is your biggest concern if that were to happen? Any questions? Any, any thoughts? Well, besides Should safety, we? food and water. Yep. Access, shelter. Yep. So that's why we always tell you to prepare and bring, and to have a bag with extra food, extra clothes, what if you're in your car and you can't go home for three days? It's kind of important. I always tell everybody to pack a bag. And sometimes the cell towers won't work either, so you won't be able to make phone calls. So if you have medicine that you have to take, make sure you have some extra in your car. All right. That's enough scary stuff. <laughs> okay, let's talk about medical emergencies. If on campus here, if you know that there's a medical emergency, somebody's going to call 911, and that will be somebody who knows the address, for sure, right? But when you call 911, what do they ask you? Has anybody ever called 911? What do they ask you? Your name. Your address. What's your name? What is your emergency? Do you know what it is? Do you well, know I did, but they didn't believe me. Okay. <laughs> So they want some stuff, they want some things for you. And what they're doing is, I've been to the 911, and it's very interesting. They type in 
as you're talking, and you can't hear them typing, but they're typing it in, and the other people are reading it. Lots of other people are reading it. So they want your name, your phone number, what is your church address, and what is the location of the emergency when you're calling? Are you in the, are you in the church? Are you in the administrative office? Are you in the Narfix? Where are you? They really want to know, where are you? Where are you calling from? So you can describe the incident and the number of prisoners uh, injured, maybe, if you're not all nervous, and the types of injuries sustained. So what would be something that would be an injury sustained that you could call about? Anybody got any ideas? Yeah, heart attack. Heart attack, good, good one. It's been a heart attack, the man's in mass, um, here's the address, there's four people with him, um, he seems like he could be breathing. They're only going to ask you a million questions, but do the best that you can. And then they will send the right response. So um, we also have professional, trained professionals at your church. St. City Paul has nurses, doctors, CNAs, people that can assist. And they will pop up and say, I'm here, I'll help you. So that's a good thing too. And there are uh, some community emergency response team members here also that can help because we've been trained on what to do. So they will come forward and triage and help and perhaps put a blanket on them so they don't go into shock and get too cold or maybe put a uh, wrap up a, a jacket and put it under their head or maybe get something cold cool them now. There's many, many things that you can do to assist. So the other thing would be to, if you're helping, look to see if anybody has a bracelet or a tag, because it may be important to know uh, that they're a diabetic and they maybe need an orange to eat or something like that. Now, um, I think that there's more than one place there's a medical kit, but this one says it's an usher's closet. Maureen, we have more than one. Yes. Correct. So just for this one, it's in the usher's closet, but I think there's more than one place. And then what do we talk about? PP&Es, who knows what those are? We talked about this earlier. Gloves, masks. Yep. Those are important masks. because if someone's bleeding, you don't want to touch them. Put your gloves on. I always carry extra gloves wherever I go. Pull them out of my pocket. Gloves, masks, safety precaution. Don't touch people who, who may vomit. You know, they may be in shock, there's lots of it. And then, if you know how to do CPR, you can administer CPR. The new, the newest way of training CPR now is just, just the pressure, not the breath. So um, sometimes they have this little apparatus that you put it in the person's mouth and then breathe in it. I suppose you could do that too, if, if you knew how, if you've been trained. And they have an AED, it's called Automatic external defibrillator, AED. Have you seen those on the wall? They tell you exactly what to do. And it's kind of like a machine that talks to you. And so that's located in the Narthex by the wall of sanctuary entry. And you'll see it. There's a good sign that tells you how to use it. All right? So one of the things about helping somebody is not to uh, move the bill or injured person, and please don't ever give them any medicine. Water maybe, if you need to. Maybe a cloth with water on it, just touching their face would be better than gulping down some water. Um, you could try to get their name, document their injury, and do they have any medical history. So it's nice to carry one of those little notebooks around with you and pull it out of your purse and use it. I have one in my purse. Um, does everybody know where the nearest hospital is? Okay, so that's what they're going to want to ask you too on the phone. What is the nearest hospital? Um, and then figure out what happened. If it's 20 minutes or it's an hour before somebody gets to you, try to document what's happening with that patient. They were, they were unconscious and then they came back and then they kind of drifted. Those are things that you can write down that people can figure out in, in the time, the time of the day. Some people will be able to assist the parking lot to direct the first responders. A lot of times that's the young kids that have been out there doing traffic. Do you have traffic kits here, Maureen? You don't? 
We have traffic kids at our church, and they wear little, little um, vests, and they help people get in and out. So you might be one of those people that can help. And then, what is the city ordinance that we're not supposed to do? Park in the fire lane. So, after the emergencies, it's so helpful if you call the parish and let them know. So some people are on the other side of the, the campus here, and they don't know what's going on over there. So it would be so nice if you would leave a message or let them know so that you can report the details to the office. And then help with the parishioners the best that you can. So in the little added part that we have here today, how many people have helped someone in a wheelchair? Yeah, that's really important, isn't it? So you need to have at least two to four people to assist in that wheelchair. And um, you want to make sure that that wheelchair is got that person secure. So if there's a seat belt, we want you to attack, hook on the seat belt. And if this, their um, wheelchair is battery operated, then it would probably be better to remove the battery that just adds to weight if you can. If you can. Those that I, I, I skip others and just, those battery powered chairs are hell to push. Yeah. Even and then I don't know if I can you can do kind of pick the battery off. They're really heavy. Yeah. So okay, well I mean, next time you get a chance take a peek at one and see what yeah. you can learn. You yeah. never know. So the other thing we wanted to talk about was taking a person down a flight of stairs. Um, <coughs> So there are some movable parts on a wheelchair, such as the armrests, the foot plates, and sometimes the wheels. So you don't want to lift that chair by those parts because what will happen? They could come off, and they, they could pinch you too. So we want to grip the front seat and the non-removable leg rests. Most of them are removable because it's just easier to get in and out of the chair especially at the doctor's office or the hospital. But you wanna, if you're gonna go down the stairs, how many people are gonna assist? Two to four. Two to four. Keep the wheelchair facing um, away from the stairs, or the stairway, so it would be backwards. And then you wanna roll the chair up or down the stairs. So you don't wanna carry the chair because that could hurt the person's back, right? And the wheelchair carries the weight. So we can tilt it, we can tilt it back and keep it secure, but don't tilt it too far, because then that can make you lose balance and pitch forward. So that's why we want two to four going down the stairs. So the other thing would be transferring the person out of the wheelchair. So always talk to the person, ask them how they're feeling. And did I miss this one? Sometimes uh, you can you can move a person by carrying them with two helpers. One in the back has got their arms wrapped around and one in the front has got their legs. And you won't go very far, but you get them away from the area that that is necessary to have them transported. So I think that's a really good way. And then there's lots of different ki types of carries. And actually, uh, last year, we practiced these carries in one of our drills. So there's called pack strap. So you've got one guy on your back. And there's a cha chair carry where two people tilt the chair back with the person, and then they carry it. And then the other one is the two-handed carry where you've got one person on each side and you carry the person in the middle. Or you can pull them by the shoulder once you've got behind them and you're using your knees. Or you can pull them by their legs. And also on a blanket. You also have a blanket carry that you teach. It's on the pole. You pull. This picture they show like the, the last one you're pulling by the feet. So I learned a long time ago that you have them on their back, but you, you cross their arms and you pull them by their right there. Okay. Okay. Yes, absolutely you can. That was just one of many. Okay. Um, but definitely can. 
And I think it's so much easier with a blanket because then you've got some of that friction with the person's back or pulling their clothes up in the back, you know, that, that can hurt their skin. So if you can put a blanket, that'd be great, yes. Are the different carries um, recommended for different type of injuries? Or some carries you wouldn't want to do for certain injuries? Well, as far as the injury concerned, I would let the first responders take care of that. But if these people are, um, maybe have a leg injury or something, you could put them in the chair and carry them out. Once you've been, you know, once you've asked one of the people, like a leader or something, could I take them out in the chair since it's just his left ankle? And they may say, yeah, that's a great idea. We'll take them over to the green area. Yeah, but there are ways to carry people out if we need to get out, just to let you know. Have you ever carried anyone out? Just a baby, maybe? A little mm. toddler, baby? Yeah, it's really important because there's times when you can do many a thing and you didn't even know that you could do it. Yeah, capable people, I like it. Okay, so after all the questions, we're gonna just go do basic stuff and teach you about things that you probably already know about, but that's okay. So, if there's a utility failure on this campus, uh, we have trained personnel to shut off the power or the water or the gas. We don't want everybody running around turning it off. So uh, there's certain people that are trained and certain people that would be asked to do such a thing if it's necessary. Um, again, they're going to be calling 911 and uh, the priest may ask them to do that or one of the leaders like Marty, perhaps, huh? So we want to use flashlights or cell phones for uh, lights, but we don't want to open flame. Why is that? Have a gas leak. Yes. Could have a gas leak, right. So we want to turn off and unplug electrical uh, equipment, computers, because you don't want to pop, pop the computer once the power comes back on. <clears throat> and light switches to avoid the power surges. So we want to ask you to please remain in the building until it's cleared and um, leave uh, by the trusted authority of your leaders. And then go cautiously outside and there may be some emergency lighting going on. You have emergency lighting out here in the parking lot or outside the building. So the next one would be the gas leak. What does the gas leak smell like? Rodney. 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 that's right. Woo, it's a terrible smell. So sometimes people will get ill or get lightheaded or get nauseous kind of sensation. And um, we want to make sure that we don't uh, get any electrical explosions getting triggered by uh, going through a, a gas-filled air. Sometimes you never know what happens and they just go So try to stay away. Um, don't, don't keep doing the activity that you're doing if there's a gas leak, and don't turn on the lights or try any electrical equipment because it could arc. And what are we not going to light? Candles. candles. No yes. candles. Don't turn on the flicker thing. So we want you to move away from the area and um, try not to use a cell phone until you're a distance away. Please report any rotten egg smell to a leader or the priest or an usher. Because even though it might not be anything, at least you've gotten to the point of thinking, could be, let's let's have it checked. And then we want to make sure that someone calls 911. If there is an odor, we can open the windows and let the air flow and then try to go out and stay about 300 feet. So, we don't shut off the gas. This, this myth is something that uh, Maureen brought to my attention. Uh, one does not shut the gas off unless the evidence of leak or smell, because crews have a hard time turning it back on if, there, if any evidence exists. And that you could speak to because of the Nusqually reaction. And give, give them an example. Well, the first thing people usually do is run to shut off the gas. But the problem is that the gas company will have a hard time getting around to everybody. 
So it should only be done if you hear the hissing noise or you smell. Then it should be turned off. Yeah. But it, if the first thing that during the Nisqually people try to do is shut off their gas right away. Mm -hmm. You will wait a long time to get it back on because they're going to be so backlogged. Exactly. So only if there's evidence. So, And we had confirmation. John Bowman is on our team. He, he's the manager of Lake Haven Utilities. And confirmed. Mm -hmm. Only do it if you have to. Because they have to be turned on by gas personnel. That's right. You can't turn them on yourself. Correct. Some people have a tool where you can use the tool. I have a tool. I, I wouldn't turn off my gas. Do you, do do you have a tool too? No. I was going to ask a question about the 300 feet from the leak. It's yeah, we want you to move away. Right. So in, in our neighborhood, we have neighbors within 300 feet. And we have a notification policy to the neighbors. That's a good idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a good idea. Yes. Yeah. Good. We'll, we'll, we'll notify our neighbors. For sure. We're good. <laughs> okay. Uh, next one would be water leaks or flooding. So you got to be careful about the uh, arcing through the water because it can spark into electrocution. Um, again, stop your activities and don't turn on the lights or the electrical equipment. Report this emergency to 911. And then turn off the local water source if it's safe. Now I would have a leader or a priest, someone in that capacity, let them know what needs to be done. And then um, it says here, cover, move objects to protect from damage unless uh, if access is safe. So yeah, we don't want books and magazines and things to get ruined by the water. If we can pick them up and move them, that's fine. And uh, please leave the area, evacuate the area. Anybody had a water leak here before? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, takes a while to get it fixed, doesn't it? Okay, so what if there's a bomb threat? Somebody calls on the phone and says, oh, we got a bomb in your church. So it's going to go off. So they really are trying to disrupt or have revenge or play a joke. Sometimes kids do those things or adults that are not happy about something and they'll make false claims. So they you can ask that person some questions on the phone. So you can ask the question like, what time of the day is the bomb going to explode? Where is the bomb located? What does it look like? And what type of bomb is it? What will cause it to explode? They might not answer your questions, but at least you're <laughs> smart enough to ask a few. Did, did you place the bomb? Why? What is your address and what is your name? <laughs> so we, we can put it all back on them. But what, you know, the, the point here is think, stay calm, ask them some questions. They might tell you. And then report that, of course, to the leaders, the priest, or someone that say, at 5 o'clock, someone called and they said, well, look, you've got your little notebook and you're writing these things down, right? Right? So during a bomb threat, you want to identify the characteristics of the caller. So was it a female or was it a male? Did they have an accent? Did they seem sober or intoxicated? Were they nervous or were they calm? Um, was there anything else about their voice? And was there any background noises? So were they, was it really quiet back there or were they like at the store? There's so many things you can think about when you're answering calls like that. And then, of course, contact 911 to report the emergency with all the information that you've gathered that you put on your notebook, and then call the parish uh, office, and then just determine, do you think we need to evacuate? If they said it was in the church, do you really think we should get the people out? What do you think? Yes. I think so, just because you never know. So if there was ever an explosion um, inside the sanctuary or the building, we're going to call 911 or notify the priest, usher, designated leader, and evacuate through the nearest exit and help others. You might have to assist a few people. Some people get really scared and they can't move. Some people are frantic and they're screaming and running. So you can assist them, you know, calm, 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 calm down. 
to stay together, put two together, and let's walk together. So there's a lot of things you can do. Try to stay away from any broken glass that might be falling, and make sure that you carefully open the doors because there, there might be people on the other side, or there might be something explosive has fallen, block the door a little bit. And we really say don't use elevators. Do you have elevators here? Yes. Yeah. And then um, move the victims. Don't move the victims unless there's really an immediate, an immediate left threat to their life. The first response, you could stay with that person and wait for a first responder or someone like a nurse to come and help. So here we are with our 300 feet again because we want you to stay at least that far away from the building and then follow directions of the first responders. Now, we have what's called, if there's someplace else on the campus that an explosion is happening, it's not in your direct area, we, they can decide whether to evacuate or what they call shelter in place. That means stay in a room where maybe there's water or a sink or water, a place where you can get something to drink, where you can be comfortable and um, where they won't be fearful. So um, if I were to uh, shelter in place at my house, I would go upstairs in my bedroom to my bathroom because that has water, I can take a shower, I can do my nails. There's a lot of things you can do <laughs> sheltered in place in your own home. So we want to make sure that you stay at least 300 feet from the affected area because there may be shrapnel, there may be shards of glass sticking up. We don't want you near that area and then follow the directions. That we have this called Regional Public Information and Notification. And it comes on the radio and it tells you much information. So you can listen to that. It's called RPIM. You can listen to that in, on your radio, probably on your NOAA radio. Okay, so how far away are we gonna stay? Good job. Okay, what if there's a hazardous material spill or leak? In the building, where would that be? Do you think? In this campus, where would it be? Janitors, probably. Probably. So we want to evacuate to a safer place. We don't want you to touch the spilled su uh, substance. And you could hold your breath or put a cloth over your mouth because you don't want to breathe in extra stuff that's not necessary. Try not to inhale any fumes or smoke. And then. Um, I know that we ask you to stay with the victims, but try to avoid touching them in case they've had some hazardous materials identified. And then tell the first responders if you feel that that's the case. So after a hazardous material spill, we want you to kind of go up the hill from the accident because sometimes it, it floats and we want you to go away from it. And then direct the personnel to the affected area. So if you're down here and it has exploded up by the parking lot, the upper parking lot, then you're going to tell the first responders up the hill. If it's down around the corner, then you can show them that it's down around the corner. Um, and then make sure you inform everybody that it might be uh, hazardous material so that they're more prepared to get on the gear that they need to put on as well. And of course, the office wants to know what's happening, right? Important to the office. So there's some strange odors that can happen if we have a toxic spill. Um, some fumes could be, you know, straying around. You could smell some funny sounds. You could also infiltrate the building with improperly stored chemicals so important to store these chemicals once they've been open and close the lid carefully. Sometimes it's like faulty refrigeration. Sometimes it's equipment malfunctions. And sometimes it's op uh, machines that are operated where the um, fumes and the intake have gotten into the pipes or areas around here you can smell them. It doesn't happen very often. But what are we gonna do? If we smell that, what are we doing? What do you want to do? Evacuate. Yeah. You want to get out, get away from there. You don't want to smell that. You could do this 
Put this up to your face. Put your shirt up to your face. Try not to smell it. Yeah, yeah. there's a lot of things you can do. And then get out, report it, contact the priest or the leader about the order, and then follow the directions on it. Question about what's the preferred direction of evacuation? The preferred direction is out. Get out of the building. If, if, if the fumes are outside, then if you would be you would be going up the hill. Or away from the fumes. Yeah. Look at the direction of the wind. You want yeah. to go upwind. upwind. The yeah. fumes will go downwind. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever. So you guys are getting it. You know, get out, go upwind, go up the hill, find the kids. Just don't stay close. Go to the upper parking lot. Yeah, we can go there. there. <laughs> I'll meet you there. So what happens if it gets on their skin? What happens if the hazardous material gets on your skin? Well, we want you to flush it. You know, flush it, flush it, flush it for at least 15 minutes. A lot of people have those water bottles. You can use the water bottles to put the water on you. Get three or four or five of them. Have somebody bring some. Um, remove all your jewelry and soak the area with no visible burns because you, you want to avoid the exposure to that chemical. So um, you want to seek medical attention after you've been exposed and remain, re re remove all contaminated clothing. So if my shirt got a hole in it right here from a chemical, I would want to remove the shirt and put on the towel. And then get to the nearest emergency shower. Do you have a shower in your building? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have a shower in our building too. And then make sure that someone knows what you what you're doing and that you have all the proper things to take care of. And then uh, contact nine, of course, contact nine one one. Okay, so what happens if we get chemicals in our eyes? We want to flush it. <coughs> These 15 minutes. Um, and they have what's called an emergency eye wash station. It looks like yellow, and you just dip your head down there, and it just soaks your eyes full of water, and you just splash, splash, splash. I think we have one on campus. I think it's in the school. We don't school? have one in the church. Yeah. Okay. Not in the church, but I thought that there was one mm -hmm. over in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. So again, we're going to notify the proper authorities and a call and let the office know about this situation because otherwise they won't know. Just, just for curiosity, where is the shower? I was going to Oh, in this building. I was talking about the Wilbur. There's one right over by Marty's office. Oh, okay. See? The men's bathroom has a shower. They would probably escort you there. They probably <laughs> wouldn't say, go take a shower. They would probably escort you yourself done properly. Yes. I have a question about hazardous materials. Uh, does a parish have hazardous materials that you have a material safety data sheet on? Um, uh, Marty has his all of his safety. Does he, does he have a binder of the yes. MSDS? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, yes. good. Yeah. yeah, and they have training once a year. Every good. year the Archdiocese okay. provides training for them on, on hazardous materials Great. and okay. what form pathogens and everything yeah. else. He, he has a lot of. <coughs> materials and he has books and he has tours that you can take and he's got a lot of good stuff going on. He's pretty sharp. Okay, so now we got through the hazardous materials. Let's go to severe weather. How many people have been through severe weather? Yeah, most of us. Okay, so in the northwest we got high winds, lightning storms, flooding, freezing, freezing rain, sleet, and heavy snow. How about you? What's your son's name? Leo. Yeah. Leo. Have you ever been to heavy storms with snow? Did you get lots of snow this year? Yeah, sometimes that can be a problem, huh? So if that happens and everybody's on campus and you can't seem to get out of the blizzard uh, or the lightning storms, we're going to remain in the building. So then we're going to use the radio, the NOAA radio, to say, Let's listen to see what they're saying within the next 15, 20 minutes. Um, the radio is located in the facilities office or the usher's closet near the narthex and, and close to the church sanctuary. So we can listen to it now. Alerts and uh, probably a bunch of you have things on your phone that you can get weather alerts too. 
So the best thing to do is move to an interior enclosed room, a restroom, or an interior st st uh, stairwell. And why is that? So that glass and stuff. Yeah. Well, enclosure. You get the windows go. You're safe. Sure. So you you're safe. That's our priority, isn't it, to be safe. And don't don't use the elevators because we never know if the electricity is going to go out. And I don't want you stuck in it. So, and then I think it's best if we just remain in place where we are and then just wait for the instructions to exit the building. And then I think if there are some issues going on during this time, well, we could check each other for injuries. Are you okay, Maureen? Are you okay? Do you, do you feel safe? Um, do you have an injury? If you do, let's get somebody over here so we can uh, get the trained personnel to administer first aid if you are injured. All right, how about volcanoes? Anybody seen a volcano erupt? Mm -hmm. Okay, it, what is a volcano eruption? It's fine, glassy rock fragments. They can cause severe respiratory problems and eyes, your eyes and open wounds. Um, you can't see very well when it erupts because there's like a cloud, right? And it contaminates, a t it doesn't always, but sometimes contaminates water supplies. It could collapse roofs because it's heavy and cause electrical storms. And sometimes ash disrupts a machinery operations and causes the car or the aircraft engines to fail. So who was around when Mount St. Helens blew? And what did they find over in eastern Washington? Ash. Yeah. Oh, bunches of ash all over the street. They, they have the engine problems over there, didn't they? Not so much us, but it does happen. So what do you think we should do? If you're, in, if you're inside, what should we do? Close the windows and doors. Close the windows, the vents and the doors, because we really don't want that coming in. Turn off the fans and the heating and the cooling and air conditioning. We don't need it spewing around and stay in place until uh, until you've told to go ahead and disperse. And traveling outdoors, probably not really a good idea unless it's really necessary. So, do you think we'd have some people that have respiratory ailments? Mm -hmm. Yes. And we want to make sure they're not rubbing it in their eyes or. Um, Make sure that we can talk to the health officials if we do have some who's feeling the effects of it. And then uh, one of the big things is to always take your, your um, furnace filters and change them out because we don't think about that, do we? Go change your filter on your furnace after you've had a ash going around. I didn't think about it, but it's really true because they collect debris. So if you're outdoors and we have this volcano eruption, we want to seek shelter indoor. So we want to protect your head from falling debris and make sure that you take care of any burns that you might have. Um, and then if, you're, if you get irritated, your eyes, your nose, your throat becomes irritated, um, move away from that area because we don't need you breathing that in and causing friction in your throat. And um, it could, symptoms could decrease when you're not any longer in contact with the, in contact with the gases or the, the fumes. And if they do continue, then be sure to call your doctor because they know what to do in the case, the case of an emergency. And please don't touch the ash. Ash has all kinds of chemicals in it. It has all kinds of glass particles in it. Um, if you touch the ash and you touch the face, you can get rash. I mean, there's just not any reason to touch it. I know people make artifacts and all kinds of things with it, but that's like their business. See, she's coughing already. <laughs> Did you get some ash down your throat? <laughs> so the other thing would be if you are outside, let's do some protection. Can you put some goggles on? Can you protect your uh, mouth from getting any ash in it? Can you pull down your sleeves and cover your arms so that you don't get any on your arms and have any irritation? 
And then try not to travel if you don't have to because traveling through ash is kind of harmful. It stirs it up, it can clog the engines, vehicles, and it's really not preferred. So my question is, can you make a difference? Can you make a difference because you learned something here tonight? Can you become informed and involved? Would you want to now? Mm -hmm. Is that a yes? Sure. Okay. Um, we can learn by emergency uh, response skills, by attending some of the trainings that are put on throughout the cities, and um, being prepared. One of the reasons that I say to pack a bag is because if you don't get home for three days, then you're prepared for yourself to take care of you. So um, you can help by being an assistant to parishioners or any people that have children that are fearful. You can calm, be a calm teacher for them. And you can also help with the first responders. And there's a lot of times that they just need somebody to sit with someone while they can go somewhere else. You can be very helpful. And teamwork is our first priority because safety is our first priority, right? Mm-hmm.